Aim for the face! It isn't working! The special forces team opened fire on the strange creature in front of them. It was like nothing they had ever seen before, and no briefing can prepare you for what it will be like when you parachute into the middle of a fight against a gigantic half-train, half-spider that seems to have no purpose except to kill. And it was succeeding in that. The train demon swung its powerful metallic legs, taking out one team member after another. As more and more of the squad landed, decked out in their tactical gear and equipped with the latest in high-tech weaponry, the fighting intensified. Grenades were tossed and exploded in a shower of shrapnel and smoke. A Gatling gun roared as it spun up to unleash hundreds of rounds. The tide of battle seemed to be turning in favor of the Spec Ops team. The creature was being pushed back. It roared as they unloaded everything they had on it. As soon as a gun would run out of ammo, the magazine would be dropped, a new one would be slapped in to take its place, and the shooting would continue. Hundreds of rounds of ammunition were dumped into the train, and it started to show signs of slowing down. More of the team landed with their parachutes, took out their weapons, and fired. The train howled in a mix of rage and pain before collapsing to the ground. It was dead. They had killed the monster. Was that it? In their briefing, they had been told the foe they would face was gigantic. This bizarre hybrid was big, but nowhere near what had been described. Barely half the size, in fact. Unless their intel was wrong. Then that could only mean one thing. There were more of these out there, and at least one that was much, much bigger. The Special Forces team didn't have much time to discuss it, but they soon got an answer to at least half of their question. There were definitely more of these spider trains on the island, and they were coming for them. An entire wave of small ones attacked. They were much smaller than the one they had just fought, barely the size of small dogs, but they were fast and vicious. The Special Forces team leader called out to reload and get ready for another fight, and the team assumed tactical positions. The horde of small spider trains rushed in towards the team and were met with a concentrated blast of gunfire. These small ones went down much easier. It seemed their exteriors weren't as hardened as the larger ones, but there were so many of them, and they just kept on coming and coming. Through sheer force of numbers, they were able to keep pushing up closer and closer to the squad, and soon, one soldier was overwhelmed by a dozen of the creatures. They kept fighting back, though, and eventually the wave subsided. The only thing left was a pile of small spider trains forming a ring around the soldiers. What was happening on this island? They had been sent here with a very specific mission. Identify the threat that had destroyed an entire Coast Guard vessel and neutralize it. From grainy footage broadcast from the ship before it had been destroyed, the Special Forces team had gotten a glimpse of their foe. A living train with eight powerful legs and the twisted, smiling face of a demon. Satellite photos taken at the time of the attack showed that the enormous creature had headed towards a cave in a mountain after taking out the ship. A separate reconnaissance team had parachuted in closer to the cave entrance, while the assault team was directed to secure the rest of the island. Now, with a break in the action, they attempted to radio the other team. The reconnaissance team leader's radio crackled to life. They relayed their position back to the assault team, and they had entered the cave in the mountainside and were progressing through the tunnels. They hadn't encountered anything yet, but... Wait, no. The assault team listened as the sounds of gunfire came over the radio. What was happening? The recon leader came back on the radio. They had encountered some of the creatures, but they were able to fight them off. They had been small, almost like they weren't fully formed yet. The reconnaissance team pressed on, stepping over the small spider trains they had killed and made their way deeper into the cave system. The narrow tunnel they were in opened up into a large chamber. It was so big that even their powerful flashlights didn't light up the far end. Their mission was to find the source of these monsters, and as far as they could tell, this was where they were coming from. They continued on, keeping the assault team informed of their progress over the radio, until suddenly, the radio went silent. Recon team, are you there? What do you see? Over. No response. What is your status? Repeat, what is your status? Suddenly a voice came through the radio, but the recon leader told them to shut up, not to make a sound. It was unclear if that message was meant for the radio or for the rest of the recon team. What definitely wasn't intended was the scream that followed. More screams, more gunfire, and then a horrible, unnatural, guttural roar came over the radio. Retreat! Retreat! The recon team started to run back the way they had come, stumbling through the dark cavern as something in the dark chased after them. Something very, very big. What is it? What do you see? Asked the assault team. It's huge! It's... But then the radio went dead. 
There were no more messages from the recon team. Whatever they had encountered in those caves had gotten them, and if it was anything like what the assault team had been fighting against, then they were almost assuredly dead. But the assault team wasn't about to leave their fellow squadmates behind. Rescue mission had just been added to their list of objectives. Just then, another radio message came through, but it wasn't the recon team. This one was from out on the ocean. They were told that their ride off the island would arrive in one hour. The helicopters would land near the docks, and if the threats were that bad, then they wouldn't be able to wait around for long. If they were going to complete their mission, they had to start moving now. As the Special Forces team jogged across the island, they kept their heads on a swivel, aware that a threat could be lurking anywhere, behind a tree, inside an abandoned cabin, or even… There! It's coming up from the ground! One of the Special Forces members pointed towards a spot on the ground where the earth began to shake and bulge up. A huge, centipede-like creature soon followed, bursting out of the dirt like a whale breaching the surface. Fire! No one on the squad needed to hear the order. They were already unloading on the giant arthropod. The centipede darted around to and fro at lightning speed, its hundred legs a blur of movement. It charged at the soldiers with its gnashing jaws and grabbed one of the unlucky humans before diving back down into the ground with them. The remaining soldiers felt the earth rumbling beneath their feet, and it emerged once again with its victim nowhere to be seen. They continued to fire their weapons, and one of the Special Forces heavy weapon specialists took out a shoulder-mounted RPG. He struggled to get a lock on the unbelievably quick creature, but then he heard the solid tone telling him he's had it and pulled the trigger. Smoke burst out of the back of the launcher as the rocket escaped its tube and headed towards the centipede, the grenade striking it square between its enormous bug eyes. There was an explosion of green goop that covered the Special Forces soldiers that caused them all to turn away. Its venomous blood burns on their exposed skin, and they had to rub dirt on their wounds to try and neutralize the searing pain. But at least the monster was dead, and they had only lost one of their own in the fight. They had to press on. The team continued their trek across the island, and soon the mountain cave that the recon team had disappeared inside came into view. As they neared it, the radio began to make noise once again. Is anyone there? Please help me! It was a member of the recon team. Apparently they were alive, but very badly injured. What was it? What happened in there? Help me! You have to help me! The assault team leader asked again for more information about what they might find once they went inside that cave, but the only response was a wet, choking cough, and then silence. The radio was dead again, along with whoever was on the other end. Whatever had attacked them in that cave had been terrifying, there was no doubt about that, but the assault team again asserted to each other that they wouldn't leave their friends in there to die, not if there was any chance that some of them were still alive. They'd rescue any who were left, and if possible, plant the tactical nuclear weapon they had brought with them and blow up whatever did this to them. The assault team reached the mouth of the cave and took out their own tracker. It immediately began to beep and point them deeper into the cave. At least it appeared that the recon team's location beacon was still functional. As the team made their way through the caves, they were attacked by more of the small creatures, but these were different from the ones they had seen outside. While they still had eight deadly metallic legs, their bodies were soft, as if they hadn't fully formed. The team's heavy weapons made short work of the small, weak ones, but soon, larger ones appeared. These ones also looked… off, as if something had caused them to develop incorrectly. But just because their appearances were wrong, it didn't mean they were any less deadly. These bigger ones took significantly more firepower to put down, and when one grabbed onto one of the assault team members' legs and dragged him into an opening high up on the wall, all the rest of the team could do was listen to his screams as he was pulled into the darkness and disappeared. The team kept fighting forward, but soon began to be overwhelmed by the sheer number of creatures attacking them. The team had to retreat, but the only way to go was deeper into the caves. They began to run through the tunnels, which became increasingly narrower and narrower. When they reached a passage that was so narrow that only one of them could pass through at a time, they stopped. There was a loud noise coming from behind them. The cave began to rumble, and pebbles and dust rained down from the ceiling for a moment, before suddenly, the ceiling collapsed. When the dust cleared, the only route back out of the caves was buried, as were another two members of the assault team. Their numbers were thinning, and everyone on the assault team had the same depressing thought. They were losing this battle. But with the tunnel collapsed and no way to go but forward, they pushed on through the narrow passageways. The tracker was still somehow active, and the team kept moving in the direction it was pointing them. 
The passage grew tighter and tighter, to the point where they thought they may soon not be able to go any further. But then, to the whole team's relief, it opened up. The squad stepped out into a giant chamber. Would you look at that? The assault team looked around in amazement. Every surface of the huge room was covered in large, faintly glowing eggs, and every single one was hatched. This must be it, the source of where all the monsters are coming from. But it raised the question, if they're all coming from eggs, who laid them? And where was the recon team survivor whose signal they were following? The tracker showed that they should be right on top of them. The assault team leader shined his flashlight straight up towards the ceiling and got his answer. There, stuck to the ceiling by thick ropes of sticky mucus-like substance, was the recon team leader. Or more accurately, the shell of what had once been the team leader. It appeared that their body had been used for food by the newly hatched spider, and now only an empty husk remained. Look! Over there! One of the assault team members was quietly motioning towards the back of the cave. The assault team leader pointed a flashlight in the direction they were motioning and spotted it. There, at the far end of the chamber, was Choo Choo Charles. The real, the first, the original Choo Choo Charles. He was bigger than any version of the train spider hybrids they had ever seen. So big, in fact, that it looked like he could barely still fit inside of his train carapace body. His massive body bulging against the metallic exterior, causing it to look like it might burst at any moment, like a train whose steam boiler might explode. One of the soldiers raised their weapon and pointed it at the enormous monster. But the leader placed a hand on the barrel of their gun and pushed it down. There was something wrong with this creature. It wasn't attacking. It looked like it barely noticed them at all. The huge Choo Choo Charles was breathing heavily. It looked like it was in pain, like it was about to die. The Special Forces team leader approached the mammoth train spider, and to his surprise, he thought he heard a voice. Did any of you hear that? But none of his team had. The voice spoke again, though, and it was now clear to the team leader that it was only in his head. The giant Choo Choo Charles was speaking, but telepathically. I know why you're here, it said between labored breaths. You're here to kill me. But before you do, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you my story, my real story. The assault leader knew it was a bad idea to allow a massive monster to telepathically commune with them, but at the same time, he felt compelled to listen. Choo Choo Charles went on to tell the assault leader that he was aware there was a rumor on the island, a rumor that he had once been the son of Warren Charles III, the owner of the mining company that had come to this island. That Warren Charles's son had been injured in a terrible accident that set him on the path to one day becoming Choo Choo Charles. But it didn't happen like that. Not exactly. It was true that Warren Charles III had come to the island. There, his miners began to dig, using the natural cave system of the island as the basis for their mine. The miners dug down deeper and deeper and deeper, but they dug too greedily and too deep. There, far below the surface, they found something. A huge, horrible creature unlike anything they had ever laid eyes on before. A creature that had been cruelly sealed away centuries before by the island's original inhabitants. But now, the miners had set it free. Once the monster was awake from its long forced hibernation, it needed to feed, and luckily, its favorite food had come right to it. The monster quickly gobbled up the miners who had breached its prison, but it needed more. The miners soon caught on to the danger lurking deep in the mine, and no longer would they dare to venture down and risk being eaten. The monster needed a new tactic to feed. Now it is true that Warren Charles III had a son, a very special boy who was oddly attuned to the island, seemingly aware of its history despite it not being written down in any history book. The boy began to feel a strange connection to something down below the surface, a feeling that he should venture down into his father's mines and explore. One night, the boy could no longer resist the urge and snuck into the mines. The boy journeyed deep down through the caves, eventually finding the monster that had called to him. The monster took the boy, with the plan to use him as ransom. The boy would be released, provided that others were sent in his place that the monster could feed on. This was Warren Charles' only son. There was no chance he would let him come to harm if it meant exchanging a few miners. 
After all, they died in the mines quite regularly in accidents, but to the monster's surprise, he refused. Warren Charles III stood at the narrow entrance to the monster's cave and called out, telling him that he wouldn't agree to the trade. The boy was expendable. His workers were not. There would be no new miners to make a meal of, but the monster had discovered another source of nourishment. Warren Charles' son was understandably upset with his father's decision to leave him to die at the hands of the monster. His sadness at being abandoned, though, soon turned into rage. Rage at his father. Rage at the entire mining operation. Rage at the entire human race. The monster recognized this burning, seething hatred inside the boy and found that it was the only source of sustenance it needed. The monster absorbed more and more of the boy's anger, growing even bigger and stronger. With his new strength, the monster was able to fully burst free from the cave prison. It saw a piece of Warren Charles' mining equipment, a huge train with mechanical spider legs instead of wheels, and crawled inside of it like a suit of plate armor, the train eventually fusing with the monster's own body to create a demonic, hybrid creature. No longer confined to the mines, the monster, which had been nicknamed Choo Choo Charles by the island's residents, began to terrorize those foolish enough to remain. As the monster killed more and more, and grew stronger and stronger, it soon found that it had the strength to begin reproducing. It started laying eggs, and the creatures that would hatch didn't look like the original monster, but the new, half-spider, half-train that it had become. The monster continued to grow too, and soon found that it was too big to leave the cavern, but that was okay. Its children would still be able to leave and hunt, and when they killed, their power would grow, and so too would their parents. He would remain beneath the earth, and would keep getting bigger, stronger, more powerful, and he would keep laying more and more eggs, and no matter how many times the humans killed one of his children, there would always be more. And the child, the son of Warren Charles III, the one he left to die, well, he did his anger turning back into sadness as he waited endlessly for his father to come rescue him. Why are you telling me all this? The assault leader was confused by what the creature could possibly hope to gain by revealing its full history. Was it some kind of trick or a trap? No, no. It's much more simple than that. I only wanted someone to know my story. But it won't matter, because now... It's your turn to die. The giant version of Choo Choo Charles began to stand up on its metallic legs, the metal groaning from the strain of trying to contain whatever was inside of it. The train monster began to emit a terrible, guttural noise, and the assault team members all had to cover their ears to try and drown it out. But the groaning was soon replaced by the sound of metal hitting the cave walls. Rivets were popping out of the train and shooting out like bullets. The assault team dropped to the ground and covered their heads to take cover as the spider-trained body exploded in a hail of metallic shrapnel. When the assault team looked up, the train creature was no longer there. Standing in its place was an enormous creature that seemed to be made entirely out of fire, a demon with eight glowing hot legs of lava. This was the creature's final form. It hadn't been dying, it was evolving. The demon attacked and the assault team fought back. They raced around the cavern and took firing positions, but their bullets appeared to have no effect on the creature. It swiped at them with its flaming appendages and took out one soldier after another, flinging their smoking, smoldering corpses across the room. The assault team leader took cover behind a clutch of hatched eggs and tried to radio for help, but there was no signal this deep underground. He then heard a strange sound. It was a voice, a little boy's voice. It was Charles, the actual original Charles, Warren Charles IV. Somehow, against all odds, he was still alive. He couldn't remember how long he had been down in this cave, the demon feeding off of his sadness and fear, but now, after seeing the bravery that the soldiers showed by coming down there to rescue one of their own, he wasn't afraid anymore. As the demon continued fighting against the soldiers, the boy told the leader that he knows how to destroy it. He needed a weapon that was very powerful, and then he could use his connection to the demon to feed it to him. The leader knew just the thing, the tactical nuke. He told the boy to wait there and darted across the room to where their demolition expert was still alive and taking cover. He brought him back to the boy and explained the plan. The boy told him that they should arm the weapon and then leave him alone to take it to the demon, their connection forged after so long meaning that it wouldn't attack him. The boy also knew something else, a way out of the cave. There was a secret tunnel hidden behind a clutch of eggs. The soldiers could take it and it would lead them right back to the surface. The assault leader told the boy no, that he won't allow him to sacrifice himself 
but the boy insisted there was truly no other way, and the leader had no choice but to allow it. The demolition expert began the arming procedure, but the demon spotted him before he could finish. He charged forward and grabbed the demolition expert with his burning spider arm, lifting him high up in the air before slamming him down into the ground in a shower of ash and sparks. The leader grabbed both the boy and the bomb and ran across the room, ducking behind some rocks to finish the arming procedure. When he completed his task, a light on the tactical nuke glowed red. It was ready. Once the button was pressed, it would only be a few seconds before it detonated. The demon took out the last remaining member of the leader's squad and turned its attention towards him. Once the soldiers were gone, the demon would be free to leave the cavern, its power strong enough to burn a hole straight up through the earth to the island's surface. It would no longer be contained. Go! Now! The boy yelled at the leader to leave. The assault leader ran towards the spot where the secret tunnel was supposed to be, as the boy, using all of his strength, held the tactical nuke up above his head. You! Yeah, you! The boy shouted at the demon causing it to turn its attention towards him. He began to criticize the creature, telling it that it was weak and pathetic, sending its own children to fight and die for it, while it hid down in a cave, feeding off of a little boy. It wasn't a powerful demon, it was a sad, miserable wretch that deserved nothing more than to spend its life in an underground prison. It never should have been woken up, and it certainly wasn't going to leave this place again. The demon was infuriated by the boy's words and began rushing towards it, its heavy legs causing the ground to shake as it kept coming for the boy. The demon was nearly on top of him, its flaming mouth opening up to eat the boy in one bite. The boy didn't move though, he bravely stood his ground, holding the bomb above his head. Preparing to press the button that would activate its final detonation sequence once the monster was close enough. But before he could press the button, the boy feels his body being grabbed and the bomb pulled away from his grip. It was a special forces leader. He grabbed the boy and took the bomb away from him, armed it, and tossed it up into the demon's mouth in one swift motion before sliding out of the way. In its surprise, the demon swallowed the nuclear weapon. It stood up, choking, and looking around for the boy and the soldier, but they were already nearly to the secret tunnel. The monster continued to choke as the timer on the bomb inside its body ticked down, and just as the boy and the soldier ducked into the tunnel, the bomb detonates. The boy and the soldier are knocked hard by the blast, the shockwave that ripples through the cave system pushing them out. They both burst out of the hidden entrance at the base of the mountain, and find that not only are they still alive, but they are staring up at the open sky, with the first light of dawn casting a warm, orange glow across the island. The cave entrance had collapsed behind them, leaving them alone on the beach, with the only sound coming from the waves. But off in the distance, the leader spots a ship making its way towards the island. The boy stands up too. He's okay. They're both going to be okay.